Um, what I'm going to do in this uh, afternoon's talk is talk about intensive reading and then uh, extensive reading. But in intensive reading, I'm going to be focusing on a particular uh, type. Now, I want to show how these two different approaches can be combined and used together. That's going to be the focus of my talk this afternoon. Now, for those of you who were there this morning, you know this answer, don't you? Everybody? Okay, now, we need to get together. And this is my definition of what reading is. But before I give you mine, I want you to think what, what you believe reading is. See if you can answer that sentence either on paper or in your head. What is reading? Reading is... Think for a minute. What is reading? Now, if you were at my morning talk, you'll know the answer. Reading is a number of interactive processes. Interactive means back and forth. Not one way, but two way. And the two ways is between the reader and the story, and the reading, and the text. Back and forth, back and forth. Now, the readers, when they're interacting with the text, use their knowledge. Knowledge of the world, knowledge of the language, knowledge of the topic, knowledge of the author, to create, to construct, to build meaning. Okay? So this means that two readers who have different knowledge, different background, different languages, will probably construct different meanings of the same text. So there is no really true meaning. There's a different type of meaning depending upon the reader. Depending on the reader. Now, I want to illustrate this with something that happened to me last May. I was in Los Angeles, and I had to cross a busy street. It reminded me of many streets in Seoul. You know, many lanes going this way, lanes going that way, full of traffic. And so I walk up and stop, because it says, don't walk. Okay, okay, good, that's, that's easy. So I stop, and I'm standing there waiting for the sign to change. And as I'm waiting, more people come. So maybe there are about 15 or 16 of us waiting for the traffic signal to change. Remember, I'm from Hawaii, right? Life is relaxed in Hawaii. We are not like people from Seoul or people from New York or Los Angeles, busy, on the go, on the edge, right? So the light changes to this. So what do I do? Yes, I walk. I walk like this. And the other 15 people are like that. And I think to myself, as I am walking, I'm glad I'm from Hawaii. Right? Life is pleasant, is relaxed. We are not stressed like these people who have to rush to get to the office, who have to run to cross the street. Life is so nice in Hawaii. And as I'm doing this, I'm walking and I'm halfway through. <laughs> and everybody else is over there. And I'm here. So what does that mean? I want to illustrate this idea of a single word sentence. Walk. I constructed a meaning based on my knowledge of the world and the, everything, but the other people had a different meaning. Walk didn't mean walk, it meant run. So, the next day, there I am, first one across the street. <laughs> okay, so this is what I mean by reading is an inter interactive process, is where depending upon our knowledge, our experiences, we create different meanings. In some cases, the meaning is not good, like my creating the meaning there. Now, reading is also magic and fun. Reading can take us to the most wonderful places. It can take us to different times, to different universes, to different cultures. 
and we never leave our chair. Now, psychologists who study the brain have discovered that when people are reading and enjoying the reading and get involved in the reading, they lose track, they forget where they are, they forget what time it is, they have sort of another, something's going on in the brain. And psychologists have attached these electrodes to the brain and they call this a flow experience, F-L-O-W, a flow experience. There's actually different brainwave activity going on when you're involved in an activity, like a flow experience. Oh, probably many of us have had that. All of a sudden an hour passes and we realize we're late for something. We were so excited and so involved in reading. Are your students having flow experiences in English? Korean teachers of English, are you? Mm. Okay, okay, let's go on. How do we learn to read? How do we learn to read? We learn to read by reading. That's all. It's, this is good news. It's not hard for us to understand. We know from research that the more reading we do, the better readers our students become. The more opportunities we give our students to engage in reading, the better readers they become. When you are talking, your students are not reading. They are not doing the single thing that will help them become readers. So what does this mean? Hmm, okay. Now, I'm going to talk about really only skills and strategies here. I'm not going to talk about these two. What I'm going to do is I want to focus on this notion of strategies. Now, you all know what grammar translation is, right? Everybody knows that. Now, there's a problem with grammar translation. Students aren't reading. There's a problem with grammar translation if you think you are teaching your students to read. You are not. You are teaching your students to translate. I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying translation is bad at all. I would never say that. Translation is translation is translation. Reading is reading is reading. They're different. So don't expect if you teach your students to translate that they're going to be able to read. No, it's different. Translation is important in Korea, in the Korean educational system, but it is not reading. Okay. Now, the next, the next approach is called comprehension questions and language work. This is often combined with grammar translation. Students read a very short, difficult passage. Often they read it at home and translate most of the stuff, put it in Korean above it. And then they come to class and answer comprehension questions, and then they study the reading passage for linguistic or gramma grammatical structures passive voice, past tense, whatever the focus of the grammar lesson is, they use the text to illustrate, to study this grammar construction. Now this is good for building grammar knowledge. It's, built for, it's good for understanding this, but it is not reading. It's, con it's language analysis and language work. Students will not become readers if they do this. Now, strategy training is very different from the other two, and I want to focus on this. I want to focus on strategy training. Now. Uh, unfortunately, well, let me see, let me go quickly here to extensive reading and then I'll come back to strategies in a sense. Now, when we are teaching strategies, when we are teaching strategies, let me back up. I know that some of you are thinking a skill and a strategy. What's the difference between a skill and a strategy? Now, I, for, for my work, here's what I do. Strategies are things that we do consciously to help us do something. A strategy is conscious behavior. Okay? Let's say that we're driving here in the city and we realize there's a big traffic jam. What do you do? You think, well, I know that if I do this or I do this, I can, do, I can get here. You're, you're strategizing. You're thinking, what can I do? I might be late. I've got to do something. So this is a strategy. 
Now, if you do a strategy often enough, frequently, it will start to become unconscious. It will start to become automatic, okay? without thinking. For example, when you were beginning to drive a car, if you wanted to come to a stop, you would think, oh, I've got to take my right foot off here, I've got to put it on here, press it on slowly. You think about that, right? But then when you become a skilled driver, you do these things automatically without thinking. And that's what a skill is. So we don't teach our students reading skills. We teach them reading strategies in the hope that they will become skillful readers. They will take this conscious behavior and make it automatic, unconscious behavior. Okay, so this is what I mean when I'm talking about an intensive reading strategy approach to the teaching of reading. This is important. We know from research that if students develop reading strategies, it will help them become better readers. Now, be careful what I'm saying. Better readers. How do we learn to read? By reading. Okay, now, reading strategies help us read to learn. But first, we have to learn to read. And we learn to read by reading. And that's where the extensive reading comes in. So what I've tried to do in this book that's on your, on your, in, your, in your packet, cover to cover, is combine the two. To merge them into a single approach, which I think is very important. So by the time your students get to cover to cover book one, they are already, they're pretty good with learning to read. Not beginners, not advanced, but Okay, so what we're trying to do is make them better readers and make them, help them read to learn. Okay, now, whew, enough background here. Now, now what I want to do is move to, the, to something that is very, very important in, in becoming both a good reader and both a reader to learn. And we make a difference in reading between comprehension, and fluency. Most, if not all, of the teaching of reading focuses on comprehension. And I believe that most of you probably are not aware of the idea of fluency in reading. I think you might be aware of fluency in, like oral fluency in speaking, but fluency in, writing, in reading is really, really important. And this is what I want to talk about today, is how this is so important. Now, comprehension strategies are those strategies that help us get meaning from the text. That is, reading to learn, get meaning from the text. And I think there are a number of basic comprehension strategies that we as teachers need to teach our students. Okay? Finding main ideas in paragraphs. For academic reading, this is a must. Students must be able to locate main ideas in reading. So what we have to do is teach them the strategy of doing this. That's really important. Oop, well, two things came up at once. Recognizing points of view. Critical in academic reading. What is the point of view? What is, what is if, if, if it's a type of reading when there are different points of view, you've got to understand the different points of view. The other one is recognizing reference words. Recognizing reference words. Uh, what do reference words mean? They help us understand a text. When I've been teaching my students in the University of Hawaii who are international students enrolled in the University of Hawaii, one of the, most, one of the major problems they have in comprehending a passage is a lack of knowing what reference words refer to. What does this mean? What does this go to? They don't understand it. So, but when I teach them this, ah, the light dawns. It's really an important strategy. Identifying meaning from context. By this, yeah, go ahead. Anyone else? Can anyone help him out? What is a reference word? That's one way of referencing. Okay, another reference word is things like this, or that, or these, or those. Sometimes students are not aware of what these things stand for. What do they mean? What do these reference words refer to? Okay. 
Yeah, but pronouns are not the only reference words. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a good example of them. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Feel free to jump in with a question. If you don't ask now, you might forget it. There might not be time. Identifying meaning from context means generally understanding vocabulary in a text. When you come to a word you don't know, what can you do? How do you identify getting the meaning of a phrase, a word, an idiom from context? Okay? This is a strategy that we teach our students. Now, fluency. Fluency. Fluency is very different from comprehension. Fluency strategies are those strategies that allow, that help students move away from word by word reading. Reading slowly is poor reading. You may think it's a good comprehension strategy to read slowly. No, it's poor. By the time students come to the end of a sentence, if they are reading word for word, they've forgotten the beginning of the sentence. So we have to teach our students to read more fluently. One good strategy is scanning. Teaching students to move their eyes rapidly through the text, looking for particular information. Really an important strategy. Another one is predicting the topic. That is, students will look at a text Look at the title, look at any pictures, quickly move their eyes through the text and predict the topic. It's a really good strategy. Skimming for the main idea, another good strategy. Ignoring unknown words. When you come to a word you don't know, skip it, keep reading. Excellent, excellent fluency strategy, not comprehension strategy. What I find when I work with teachers, they have a hard time moving away from comprehension and getting into fluency. It's a bit tricky at first. I'm going to give you a little activity that I think will maybe illustrate some of these things. Recognizing signal words. Signal words. First, next, in addition, in conclusion, also, to, T-O-O. -O, okay? These things are, are what I call signal words. They really don't carry meaning in the sense of verbs and nouns, but they help us move along through the text. And when we spot them, we know what's coming up. Something else is coming up. So recognizing signal words is an excellent fluency strategy. Now, what we know in teaching reading strategies, there are some very important things that we learn from research. Number one, we have to teach strategies in context. Just teaching a strategy and then say use it doesn't work. So what we have to do is supply the students with a reading that allows them to employ, to use the strategy. Okay? You've got to do it in context, we know that. The second thing that we know is that we have to provide an explanation, a reason, a rationale for the strategy. Why should you ignore difficult words? You want to explain that to your students. Because you don't need to know every word in the text. That's an important strategy. When we stop and look up words in a dictionary, it slows us down. And then we've got to go back and read again and read again, and it slows us down. It takes time. I did a study in Japan a number of years ago, and I gave the treatment group a dictionary, and I gave the students in the control group, I said, don't use a dictionary. And I gave them a time, and I read it, and I timed them. And the students that used the dictionaries took twice as long as the students who didn't have access to a dictionary. And there was no difference in their comprehension scores. So the reading, the whole thing it did was just slowed them down. took them twice as long. So this is a really important thing. Explain why a strategy is appropriate. Recycle. You know what I mean by recycle? Again and again and again. The last thing that you want to do is give a strategy to your students in context and explain it and then practice it one week and forget about it. That is a sure way to guarantee the students will not use the strategy. We have to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. This is from research. This is from research on strategy training. So we want to recycle it, recycle our strategies. It's very, very important to, to repeat it again. Now, what I want to do is demonstrate to you the importance of fluency here. <clears throat> now, just a second, let me go back. Go back. Okay, 
too much. I'm not used to this uh, one here. Now, what I want you to do when I press this now, I'm going to go to this next slide. You saw the word W-H-E-N, right? I want you to just sort of put down your pens and I want you to read what comes up on each slide. Okay? What I, the purpose of this is to show you why word for word reading is inappropriate, it's hard to get the meaning, and how important fluency is in reading. Okay? Are you ready? Get the idea? No. This is what often many, many readers in foreign languages do. They read word for word for word, and it's a, it's a very inefficient way of going about reading. Now, what happens is if our students are reading like this, it's painful. They have to go back and read and read and read again. And when our reading class is over, they probably, most likely, will not go home and read in English. Right? Because reading in English is like this. It's very, very, very difficult. So what we want to do is build up our fluency, build up our students' fluency. And one way of doing that is by increasing reading rate. And these fluency activities that we have in Cover to Cover and that I mentioned to you will help move our students away from word for word reading. Fluency is the basis of comprehension. If our students aren't reading fluently, they're not comprehending well. So we've got to work on fluency. This is kind of, of, a, of, a, of a theme that I have when I'm working with uh, students is building up, building up our fluency. Now, one way, one exciting way to build up fluency is extensive reading. We know from research that if our students read a lot of easy, interesting books, they will become fluent readers. Now, here's a, here's a pretty wordy definition of extensive reading. Uh, I'll let you read that. You'd, I don't have to read it to you because you can read it fluently. Any questions on the definition before we go to the next slide? Before we move on? Okay. Now, if your students engage in extensive reading, good things will happen. Really good things will happen. We know from re now this is not my opinion. Okay, this is research. We know they become better readers because we learn to read by reading. Okay, so this is automatic. This is a guarantee. Also, what happens is their vocabulary increases. We know this from research. Now, this means two things. Two things. They learn new words through reading. Something else happens with vocabulary knowledge. They learn new meanings of old words. Okay? Think about that for a minute. They already know the meaning of a word, but as they read extensively and are exposed to a lot of print, they learn that 
Different words have different meanings. Okay? Now, this sort of a benefit from extensive reading is incidental. Incidental. It's not direct teaching. But as students read, a consequence of the reading is more vocabulary. But what I try to do is teach vocabulary through extensive reading, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We also know that they get improved writing skills. Isn't that interesting, that they, they learn to be better writers through reading? We know in many situations, good writers are good readers. Reading and writing go hand in hand. And when students read a book and you give them a writing task to do, a writing activity, they are actually writing about a real experience, not about a make-believe experience that we assign to them as a teacher. But when they are writing about a book that they have read, not a book report, but a real writing assignment, they are engaged in real writing. In addition, there is, have, there is what I call the affective dimension. They have better attitudes and increased motivation, not only for reading, but for learning the language in general. It's quite exciting when this happens. Students get excited about reading and learning the language. In addition, you as a teacher, here's a benefit that I'm sure you didn't know. Yeah, research has established this, that teachers who use extensive reading, they themselves lose weight. In addition, their love lives improve. <laughs> For sure. And, and guess what? You are named Teacher of the Year. And then you win the lottery. Well, at least you can probably read about these topics if they don't really happen to you. Okay, now, um, this is a bit of an ad here, okay? What do students read? What should students read when they're doing extensive reading? There's something that I call language learner literature, LLL, language learner literature. Material, books that are specially written for language learners, for language learners, okay? And uh, all the publishers have them. And since Oxford uh, brought me here and we're at Oxford Day, I should say, go buy Oxford bookworms because they're 20% off. Uh, seriously, they're pretty good stuff. They're pretty good stuff because they've got a variety of things. Um, they have, there are, there are several kinds of language learner literature, and bookworms is the same thing. There's something that is, you probably are aware of this, adapted readers. Adapted. A story like Aladdin or Little Princess or books that are classics in English are made appropriate, modified, for developing readers, for people who are learning to read. Then there's also original material that is originally written for language learners. They're both good stuff. They're both good stuff. Originally written and adapted. They're both good. Okay. Now, uh, these here are all adapted. Aladdin, Little Princess, Love Among the Haystack, The Withered Arm. These are classics. These are all adapted readers. Now, what I've done, I'm still on an, I'm still on a, an advertising mode here very quickly. What I, as I mentioned before, what I tried to do was combine comprehension and fluency work with extensive reading. And it seems to have done a job. Okay, now, let's, do, let's look at some extensive reading activities. This is a great activity. I do this with my students at least once a week. If I have a long class that needs an hour and a half, then I'll just do it once a week. But if I have a class that meets two or three times a week, I'll do it every time the class meets. It's called timed repeated reading. I tell my students to take, a, take their books if they're doing extensive reading, or you can do it with intensive reading, it doesn't matter. The important thing is to have them use a reading that they have already read. Not a new reading, but some material that they are familiar with. And I have them start at the beginning of the text and read for one minute. And I tell them, don't read fast, don't read slowly, read comfortable. Just write. Read for one minute. Stop. Underline the last word you read. Everybody clear? Go back to the beginning. Don't continue. Go back to the beginning. Read for one more minute. Don't read fast. Don't read slowly. Read just right. Stop. 
Underline. Do it one more time, a third time. Stop. And 99.9% .9 of the time, students read more each time. They are increasing their reading rate without increasing their reading rate. Almost a contradiction. They're not thinking, I'm reading faster, right? They are still reading comfortably. But what they are doing is increasing their sight vocabulary. This gets a little technical. Let me explain. S-I-G-H-T, sight vocabulary. Okay? Sight vocabulary are those words that students, that readers, recognize automatically, correctly, instantaneously, every time, regardless of context. So every time you see the word the or dog, D-O-G, any word that you can recognize automatically, your brain does not have to stop and process it and think, what does it mean? Instantaneously, you know what it means and you can go on to the next word. Okay, you get the idea? Sight vocabulary. Now, how do you get sight vocabulary? By reading, by encountering words over and over and over again. This is why we say you learn to read by reading, because you're learning sight vocabulary. If you have a small sight vocabulary, you're going to engage in word-for-word -word reading, because your brain has to stop every word and figure out what it means. But if you don't have to stop, if you go boom, ah, boom, boom, just like that, you're going like this. Your eyes are moving right across the page. Okay? So, sight vocabulary. Now, extensive reading is one way to build up sight vocabulary. Timed, repeated reading through research that I've done, I've demonstrated that this also works to increase sight vocabulary, which increases reading rate, which increases fluency, which increases comprehension. It works. Now, if you use this activity, what I do is have my students fill out a TRR, Timed Repeated Reading Chart, after every session. And it has the name of the book or the name of the material they read, the date, time one, how many words per minute did you read, time two, time three. So they've got to count, one, two, three, four, five, six. And it's really great because you can see them. They might start at 60 words per minute, 60, 65, 70. The next time. So, in this TRR chart, so they fill in each num each the number of words they read per minute each time. And then over time, they will start and go up and go up, and so there's concrete evidence. They can see, oh, I'm reading more words per minute this time than I did two weeks ago, three weeks ago. It really works. It really, really works. Now, how much teacher preparation time? <laughs> Negligible, exactly. Five-star activity. Five-star activity because you can do this activity and it pays big, big dividends. It really works and it's not a hard activity to do. And it's simple to do. Rereading. This is a great activity too. Have students reread it. Reread a book, reread a, re a, a text. Simply the act of just rereading it. Just say, take it home. You've read a book, read it again. Really a good act. Just rereading something helps to build fluency. Helps to build fluency. They've got an idea of what the, what, what the story is about. They've seen the words before. It's a great activity. Rereading, very simple. Predicting. Predicting is another fluency activity. You predict what the story is about, and then you read to confirm what it is. It's a, it helps build fluency. It's a wonderful activity. Thinking about the story is another activity. Once students have finished reading a book, I have them think about it, what did they like about it? Anything. Just think about it. Then I ask them to read it again. It's a combination of rereading and thinking about it. It's just really a nice activity. Because they're thinking about it and they're, they're looking back and thinking, ah, did I read this? Did I understand this? I like that activity. Now, this is another terrific activity. I have not done research on this, so I can't confirm to you and say, by a research base, I know this works. But from my own experiences as a reading teacher, I know that when students listen to a story, it helps them build fluency, especially at the beginning stages of developing reading. When you're, become, when you're a low-level reader and you're moving towards fluency, if you can listen to an oral rendition of the story, it helps you. 
Now, most of the graded readers that are on the market today, including Oxford's bookworms, have CDs. And the texts are on the CDs. Students can listen to it, and what they do is get a connection between form and sound. They're making a connection between the sound of the word and the form on the page. So when you see the word and you hear it, you make a connection. Okay? Think about learning another language, for those of you who have learned languages a while ago. One of the difficulties in reading was getting a connection between the sound and the symbol. I was learning Thai this summer when I was working in Thailand, and I was trying to read. Thai has 46 consonants for openers. 46, think about that. Consonants alone, and each one has its own symbol. So how, how is this pronounced? How do I do it? Well, I had my colleagues, my Thai colleagues, read children's stories to me. And they, the meaning was fairly easy because there would be pictures there. And I could get the connection between the sound and the symbol. So I sort of moved into reading pretty quickly because I had the sound and the symbol listening to an oral recording of it. Okay, in this case, it was a real, a real recording. Now, what do we mean by extensive reading when we, when we say a lot? What I mean is many, many books per term. Many books per turn, not just a few. Maybe as many as 60 or 70 books. I ran an extensive reading course in Japanese at the University of Hawaii. In Japanese. And in 10 weeks, one student read 62 books. The average of the class was 32 books in 10 weeks. That's what I mean by a lot of books. Okay? Now, easy. Easy. Easy is good. Hard is bad. Our students are humans. Most humans avoid pain, avoid difficulty. We look for pleasure, we look for fun, we look for an enjoyment. Easy, we want students to read. If our books are hard, students aren't going to read that much. If the books are easy, they probably will read more. Steve Krashen says to learn a language, we need comprehensible input, which is I plus one. I is your current level of understanding. You need to have a little bit beyond that. But for reading, it's I minus one. It's got to be easy. Easy is good. Easy builds speed. Speed builds fluency, builds understanding. If students are reading hard text, they can't build the fluency. It's impossible. Hello, where did you come from? That's my daughter. She's part Korean. This was taken when she was five years old. I'm going to tell you a story, true story. Leanne is her name. When Leanne was five, I, I, I thought I was a good father. I tried hard, right? We all make mistakes, but, you know, anyway. I said to her, Leanne, it's time to take piano lessons. You know, that's what fathers do. Mothers, fathers, p ballet, swimming, you know, that stuff. And so she looked at me, because she was a very good daughter at that time. She hadn't discovered boys. That came later. <laughs> and she said, okay, Dad, that's a good idea. Let's take piano lessons. <laughs> well, her reply of let's was understandable, because as she was growing up, we did everything together. We rode bikes, we surfed, we boogie boarded, we snorkeled. You know, Hawaii, what you do. Okay, so she assumed that we were going to take piano lessons together. So I quickly thought for a minute and said, I love piano music. I really do. Beethoven's Fifth Piano Concerto. Ah, if I'm feeling down or depressed, I'll put on a Mozart or a Chopin or Liszt or something, and the music rises and my spirits lift. So I thought, okay, cool. That's great. Let's take piano lessons. So I found a teacher nearby who would do both adults, beginners, and children, beginners. And we go for our first lesson. Together, I had the first half hour, and my daughter, Leanne, had the second half hour. I sit down at the piano, and my teacher, new teacher, put on some piano music for me to look at and to sort of play. I have a question for you. Did she give me Beethoven's Fifth Piano Concerto? Why? Too hard. Yeah, too hard. What did she give me? She gave me music that was specially written for adults at the beginning stages of learning to play the piano. Now, what should you give your students? Material that is specially written for their level. 
Otherwise, it's wrong. You've got to start where they are. Okay? Now, Beethoven's fifth is my goal. You don't start with the end. You don't start with material that is written for L1 readers, so-called authentic material. Don't listen to those people who tell you you've got to read authentic material. They're killing you. Authentic material, if we define it as material written for L1 readers, is too hard. That's the goal. Don't start there. Start with material that is specially written for the level your students are. Okay? That's the story of Liana. She's 22 now. She doesn't look like this. Okay? <laughs> okay. Now, we're just about at the end of our time here. Now, I had a goal of introducing you to this idea of strategy reading, which is really good to help our students read to learn. Exactly. Extensive reading helps our students learn to read. And so that's what we're trying to do in this cover to cover. And this came out of my work as a reading teacher. Uh, many people think of, of, of people who are at a university as professors who only do research and things like this. I am a reading teacher. I taught reading this summer in Thailand. I taught it three years ago in Vietnam. I teach reading to students like you do. And so this stuff comes out of my own experiences as a reading teacher. Let me tell you as we close now. I got my start here in Korea as a, re as a teacher of English as a foreign language. I was here as a young man in the army and I lived in Yongsan. And I started to work with uh, Korean businessmen teaching them English. And then they had a son and they had a daughter and pretty soon I was teaching and they were at Seoul National in Yongsei and the last group of students I was teaching before I left Korea was, uh, were here at uh, Iwa. So I have a, I, I believe for me that this is my my home, if you will, as a professional uh, language teacher. I got my start here. So when I come back here, it's coming home, right? And it's just strangely enough, my daughter, you know, is part Korean, so I just feel at home here. Uh, this is an aside thing, just a personal note, because when I get back to Korea, I think, ah, it's good to be home <laughs> and have good food. Okay, and the second goal was to show you how we can try to incorporate this this idea of intensive reading with comprehension and fluency with extensive reading to help our students do it. I wanted to, I wanted to say, Kamsa Hamnida for coming. I really, really appreciate this.